When I made the decision that I was going to start reviewing 205 Live, I did it with kind of a laugh in my voice. I thought, okay, nobody's going to watch this, nobody's going to give a shit. But I mean, they had to figure out the title situation, and I heard they were going to get a GM, so I thought that might be good for a laugh. I didn't realize that Triple H was going to take over the damn show and turn it into NXT 2.0. Let's talk about it. What's going on, everybody? It's your buddy, it's your pal, Spaz Phoenix, the YWC Reality Check, here with your February 13th pre-Hallmark Day 205 Live review. Um, guys, this is becoming a really, really good show to review, so I guess my timing was okay. I really wish I could take credit, uh, but this was sort of a, an idea off the top of my head. I didn't know as I said in the intro, that Triple H was going to take over the show. I didn't know that they were going to basically make this the second coming of the Cruiserweight Classic. I didn't know that they were going to incorporate uh, people from the UK division, people from the NXT division, people from 205 that haven't really been focused on in a proper way. This is really the melting pot, and I said this a while ago. I said this, uh, actually, when I did the Aftermath video for Royal Rumble Weekend, uh, I, th I said, why don't we expand NXT to two hours and include the 205 Live division and the UK division? Now, you really don't need to do that anymore because everything that is aired on the network is sort of intertwining anyway. And that is okay. We were all worried about Roderick Strong debuting on the main roster, but if he's going to do debut on the main roster on 205 Live, still under Triple H's watch, he's going to do all right. Same thing can be said for Hideo Itami. Same thing can be said, uh, maybe not, maybe not for Tyler Bate, because apparently he's got heat in the back for no showing a show or some bullshit. Go check out some news. Go check out my buddy OK Fabe if you want wrestling news. I don't do that that often unless I've got something really arrogant and sarcastic to say about it. But, um, you know, Mark Andrews tonight is a great example, and he's somebody we haven't really seen featured really prominently, even on NXT. Um, somebody we're going to talk about showing up next week, which really kind of has me scratching my head a little bit, but, uh, you know, if it's not working over here, let's make use of it over here, I guess is Triple H's mentality. We start off the show tonight with a great recap, just in general, Triple H taking over the show. It's going to be good. I'm not going to sit here and shit on Vince McMahon because uh, that's something that people do to grab headlines. That's something people do because it makes them sound edgy. That's quite frankly something that JD from New York would do, and I'm not JD, thank God. We start off the show with a great recap of the tournament so far. The people that have advanced so far are TJP, Cedric Alexander, Kalisto, uh, Roderick Strong, which was, a, which was a good one. And we get some hype for the matches that we're going to see tonight. Akira Tozawa versus Mark Andrews and Drew Gulak versus Tony Nese. Um, but there's no other sort of dilly-dallying around. We get right into the first match. It's Akira Tozawa versus Mark Andrews. And let me tell you something, right? I like Mark Andrews. You guys know... I'm all for big superstars, I'm all for a big five-star classic match, I'm all for two big names going at it, and Mark Andrews, while he's a great wrestler, isn't really either one of those, he, he's not somebody you put up there with like a like a Benoit Guerrero type match, or, or, a, or an angle Daniel Bryan match, and he's not somebody that you put up there, you know, Rock versus Hogan as far as star power goes, but the guy is fun, I like fun characters, now not corny, that's different, but fun characters. It is fun to be a fan of The Miz. It is fun to be a fan of Braun Strowman right now. It is fun to be a fan of Elias. It was fun to be a fan of my boy The Miz before they fucked him over. Uh, it was fun. It's, it's fun to be dealing with fun guys. And I was about to put in my notes that I really like his theme song because it pops and it sounds sort of different from everything else. So if it was by CFO, um, congrats to them for sort of you know, getting out of their typical thing. I mean, no, no offense. CFO, give us the Nakamura entrance. Give us the, the, uh, the glorious entrance. Give us the Finn Balor entrance. It's all good. But their, the, their level of epicness is sort of even. Whereas this is very different. But I, but I didn't get a chance to write that down because the commentators immediately tell us that he is a member of a band over in the UK, uh, where, where you know, where he calls home and whatnot. And it's actually his band that does his entrance music. Now that's interesting because I know guys from the UK division 
are still performing on local shows. I know you guys have seen my uh, my highlight packages from the Destiny shows I've been to uh, here in Mississauga, and we've seen Pete Dunne more than once. We've seen Austin Aries, obviously, who's not in WWE anymore, and we saw James Ellsworth, etc. But it, it does draw an interesting question. Is this the music he uses on the indies? And if it's being used on a WWE show, how does the licensing work for something like that? Now, I don't really care, but I think it's very cool. I think it would be much much the same as uh, when Jericho helped put over that jobber over in uh, New Japan. I think he used the song, his, uh, his own song, Judas. I think anybody in WWE that has any musical chops whatsoever should be given that opportunity. Now, I know the UK guys are different because they are on sort of limited schedules and they can sort of go and do whatever else so they can bring their music with them and it's all good but um it really does if you have somebody playing themselves to the ring you know the music is going to fit them i guess is the point that i'm trying to get around to but anyways let's get into the match the match was a lot of fun i swore on a stack that i thought mark andrews was just being brought in to put over akira tozawa much like tyler Bate was a couple weeks ago for uh for tjp how wrong i am and you guys know me. I don't exactly shy away from being wrong, and sometimes I like it. So let's talk about the match. Let's stop uh, hesitating. Let's stop uh, procrastinating. Color and elbow tie-up, and they trade headlocks to start, and they trade some pins in the early going. There's a trip and a leg lock by Andrews, an ankle lock and a toe lock. He keeps transitioning from the leg lock to the ankle lock to the toe lock. And Mark, and the story of this match is Mark Andrews working on Tazawa's leg a lot. Octopus stress by Andrews and some rolling arm drags, a series of kicks by Tozawa and a low drop kick by Andrews. You know, it's not quite on anything you can do, I can do better, but it's close. You want to do some stuff with your feet, I'll do some stuff with my feet. Boot to the chest and a running Sinton by Tozawa, an abdominal stretch by Tozawa, a takedown and some stomps. Tozawa with the stomps is, is really fucking evil as well. Chops by Tozawa, Snapmare and a seated abdominal stretch, forearms by Andrews, and a 619 to the midsection, which made me laugh. Spring, it made me laugh mostly because people thought that Rey Mysterio was going to be in this match, and then, you know, he's flopping over in New Japan instead. So that's a thing. Modified Indian Deathlock by Andrews, Head Scissor and a Shining Wizard by Tozawa, Suicide Dive by Tozawa. Now, here we go. Here is one continuous sequence from Mark Andrews. I, I keep wanting to call him Mandrews because that's what they called him in TNA. But I'm really trying not to, so excuse me if I did. This is one continuous sequence from An from Mark Andrews. See, I almost did it again. Mark Andrews. Double knees in the corner. D never lets go of him. Pulls him out of the corner right into a German suplex. Rolls through the German suplex into a standing corkscrew press. That was basically one maneuver by Andrews. Fucking great. Uh, high back suplex by Tozawa and some forearms, a kitchen sink by Andrews, a super kick by Tozawa, tornado stunner by Andrews, which is apparently called the stun dog millionaire, which is just corny enough to be fucking amazing. Hesitation, top rope head scissor by Andrews. Now, if I say hesitation, I mean he's got Tozawa up on the top rope. He goes for the top rope head scissor. Tozawa tries to block it, so he he goes down and he's sort of dangling there, sort of like he's about to take a mid um, a mid air styles clash. But he pulls himself up. Core strength of this guy is out the wazoo. Uh, pulls himself back into the head scissor position, whips back, hits off the head scissor successfully. Tozawa tries for a quick pin. Andrews counters it and gets the win over Tozawa. Now this is mind-blowing to me because two guys that I thought were going to go ahead in this and you know they happen to be both Japanese but whatever we just had two Japanese people win their two respective rumbles so I guess they can't win everything <laughs> that's incredibly racist and gonna get me in a lot of trouble I bet I could have sworn that Tazawa and Atami were two guys that were going to go far in this tournament. Now, there's always a haze over Atami because people are always saying he's got one foot out the door but I mean they keep putting him in spots I say, do what I did on 2K18, make Tozawa and Atami a tag team, throw some belts on them on the main roster, but, you know, who's going to listen to me? Andrews gets the win, which is great. Um, I don't know who he's going to face. We haven't actually seen the Bracketology, so we don't know what winners are going to face what winners, which is mildly frustrating, I'm not going to lie. But, I mean, it does it does mean you're still going to gonna get some, uh, some surprises every week, at least when... Uh, 
when we're down to eight superstars, we know who the eight superstars are, but we don't know who's really going to face who. I really hope that it's Mark Andrews versus TJP in the next round, because I think that match will be insanely fun with how cocky TJP is now and how he's sort of honing that cocky character and how much, just generically, how much fun and how likable Mark Andrews is. They will bounce off each other like freaking crazy. In the back, I should say, going into this, we knew that there was going to be four more people in the tournament. Obviously, next week, to round out the 16, there was going to be Arya Davari, Mustafa Ali, Gentleman Jack Gallagher, and one unknown person. Oh, yes. Now, initially, on Twitter, I don't know why this was put out there, because apparently it's wrong, uh, Jack Gallagher put out that it was Mustafa Ali facing uh, Arya Davari, and him facing somebody that he didn't know, and he was uh, belittling, uh, um, what the fuck is his name? Rockstar Spud, fuck. Um, Drake Maverick about who his opponent was going to be. Now, that was a little bit of a misdirection because it's going to be Jack Gallagher versus Mustafa Ali next week as the second last match of the first round, and that's all good. He's being interviewed about that, and Drake, Drake Maverick comes in, interrupts the interview to tell him to he better come next week with proper wrestling attire, which is a stab at him wrestling in a suit, which is a stab at the old creative of 205 Live, which makes me smile. But it leaves us with Arya Davari versus who? Arya Davari versus who? As we pull out from this particular backstage segment, we see the actual graphic for Gallagher versus Mustafa Ali, and we see the graphic for Arya Davari versus, drum roll, Buddy Murphy. For reasons. <laughs> Now, in all seriousness, you guys know what I thought about the Blake and Murphy team on NXT. All they did really was hold uh, Alexa Bliss back, and they split them, which is great. You know, a big tag team split up is supposed to be some big thing, and it's supposed to do something for somebody. Uh, what's Wesley Blake doing right now? He's in some random ramshackle team with somebody else. Read the spoilers. Don't care. Buddy Murphy. I don't know when the last time we saw Buddy Murphy was, but to WWE's credit, they do great video packages. They did a great video package on him. It was partially him in a backstage interview, partially him, you know, narrating what he did in NXT. You know, he would, he found the highest of heights as tag team champions when no, he really didn't. Nobody really cared. Everybody was looking at Alexa Bliss. But he says, that's who I was. This is, I got to look at who I am now. I got this call from Drake Maverick, which is some good storyline continuity there. And then it was more or less the story of him cutting down to 205 pounds so that he could accept Drake Maverick's invitation to the Cruiserweight tournament to be part of the 205 Live roster. And they cap off the video with, you know, a bunch of people all gathered around. I don't know who it is because it's the back of a bunch of heads. But it's the official weigh-in for Buddy Murphy, and he came in at one, or sorry, 204.4 pounds. So he's just under the limit. I think it's. I think they did a similar thing with Cedric Alexander uh, in the actual Cruiserweight Classic, did they not? So, as much as I didn't care about Blake and Murphy, as much as I really didn't like the fact that they held Alexa, Alexa Bliss back in NXT, and because of that. She really can't ever claim to be the NXT women, uh, former NXT Women's Champion. Um, kudos to WWE. With this video package, they got me at least interested. It's not like I turned on the dime, but I am at least interested to see what he does next week. He's going to face Arya Davari, who, let's face it, is not going to advance. Um, Jack Gallagher is not going to advance either. He's going to come back next week in regular wrestling attire, which is great, but he's going to fall to Mustafa Ali because Mustafa Ali is ridiculously fucking over. Tony Nese versus Drew Gulak. Now... Before I get into this match, this was a great match, and there's a lot of fucking great spots in this match. I do wish, for my own personal viewing pleasure, I wish they had switched the order. I wish they had started with this and ended with uh, with Mark Andrews versus Akira Tozawa. That's just me. That's just because I, I care more and I'm more entertained by Akira Tozawa, and I care more and I'm more entertained by Mark Andrews than I am by either of these two. But that's because their creative direction... In the, in the Cruiserweight Classic and going forward, they weren't anything. They were fill-in-the-blank guys. They were backup guys. They were the, the, the guys that you put in the ring with the guy you're trying to put over. They were the 205 Live equivalent of Dolph Ziggler without the charisma. Uh, let's be real for a second. Now, that's not to say that they're not talented. 
please don't come at me. And this is a great fucking match that we're going to talk about in a second. This match should have started the night, and Tozawa and Andrews should have ended the night, in my opinion. It doesn't mean that I didn't enjoy this match, and it doesn't mean that I didn't scratch the fuck out of the Dooming Clipboard of Doom trying to take notes on this match. So bear with me, because my writing is even shittier than usual, but here we go. Gulak starts off the match with a handshake. you got to remember going into this match as well, and the commentators did a really, really good job of reminding us of this. Drake Maverick, again, this is a really bad shot at the former creative, uh, you know, basically did the, you know, what the hell happened to you two guys? You All you want to do is count your abs, and all you want to do is walk around like a poof with your, uh, with your, um, you know, your picket signs and your suits and your buttons and your bouquets and all that shit. Now, he tried to lay, light a fire under both of these guys. He lit a fire under Drew Gulak, and Tony Nese sort of took that, you know, what the fuck, I know what I'm doing, I don't need advice from you type of attitude. Not a word said, but the instant these guys came to the ring, you could see the difference. And I think right off the bat to have a such a drastic difference in one week in both characters, because Tony Nese's arrogance went up and Drew Gulak's aggression went up, makes for an interesting pairing. Plus, the commentators can hound home that these guys have been friends forever. They were in a faction for a little while on 205 Live, even though they can't mention Enzo, which makes them sound like fucking retards. But uh, it made for a great story all the way along. Gulak tries for a handshake, and Nice kicks it away. There's a collar double tie-up, and Nice poses like a goofball. There's a lot of mat-based chain wrestling. And I don't know what Nigel McGuinness is going for here, because he keeps talking about Drew Gulak's rules and his, you know, all his shit for a better 205 Live and the PowerPoint stuff, which, ideally, you think is the direction that 205 is trying to get away from. So every time somebody did a high-flying maneuver, it's like, oh my god, he's breaking one of Gulak's rules. It's like, let's just... Let's just forget about that. Forget about the two of the 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 PowerPoint for a better two hundred five live, etc. I like Nigel McGuinness, but that was that was a that was a misstep in my opinion. Uh, Armbar by Gulak and knee lock by Nice, and it gets reversed by Gulak. A boot by Gulak. Uh, I told you my writing sucks. Back elbow by Nice and a series of kicks. A trip by Nice. A series of stomps and a, a modified abdominal stretch. He locks his foot in place with one foot, and with the other foot, or sorry, with the other leg rather, he locks in a sort of Half half laying, half sitting abdominal stretch. Very, very awkward for me to explain. Obviously, springboard stomps by Gulak, an armbar, body shots by Nice, a face buster, and a boot, and a lariat. In ring collision. I don't know what they were going for, but they kind of ran into each other. Gul uh, nice, you know, pulls the match back together and hits a gut buster. Dropkick by Gulak and a cradle exploder suplex, which is fucking great. Many, many, many open hand shots to the face and an electric chair drop and a, and a pin attempt by Gulak. Sleeper body scissor combination by Gulak. Trip on the apron and a suicide backflip by Nice. Now, I will say, Nice is one of the larger cruiserweights they have in the division. So watching him not only do a suicide dive over the top rope, but a suicide backflip after something as simple as a trip on the apron is something to see. Now, once again, I'm going to have to go into, like, this is all in one condensed amount of time, like I did in the first match. Nice misses a 450 splash, recovers with a pump handle falcon arrow. Fucking yes. Hits a high knee. Inverted powerbomb snake eyes. So he takes him up in the powerbomb position. I don't... Uh, Big Show did this for a little bit. It's where you get him up in the powerbomb position, but instead of bringing them back down again, you drop them back face first. Well, he did that. Inverted powerbomb combination, because when he falls back, he also snake eyes him, which is fucking wonderful. And then picks up his almost lifeless body and hits a one-arm running buckle bomb on the bottom turnbuckle. So he slams his head into the bottom turnbuckle and the and the mat six, uh, in succession from a one-armed running power bomb position. Fucking insane. Gulak tackles knees from the apron to the commentator's table, and then he snaps, which is great. He just runs his head over and over and over and over again into the announce table while Nigel McGuinness is losing his fucking shit on commentary, trying to remind Gulak that if you get disqualified, you are out of this tournament. You will lose your shot at the title. You will lose your shot at WrestleMania. Fucking great. Lariat by Gulak and a double powerbomb. Basically, deadlift powerbomb and then deadlift powerbombs him again. Locks in... Uh, the maneuver that I think he used in the Cruiserweight Classic, if I'm not mistaken, it's the uh, reverse uh, reverse sleeper or the dragon sleeper combined with the body scissors. Uh, nice is not even with it enough to be able to tap out. Referee basically makes the decision. Gulak gets the win. 
fucking amazing. Here's what I'm going to say about this. And here, here's the dichotomy. And anybody that's been watching my NXT reviews for a while knows that I've said this about people like Roderick Strong. I've said it about people like Cassius Ono. I've said it about people like Andrade Cien Almas until he changed his character over. Fucking amazing match for two characters that I don't give a shit about. And that's sad, but I, I want to take my hat off as much as, you know what, where's the hat? Where is the hat? God damn it, the gimmick hat is lost. I was going to do the whole actual taking off of the hat. But I want to take my hat off to Tony Nese and Drew Gulak. I'm um, going to focus on them a lot more now. Gulak's going to be fucking crazy, and Tony Nese is going to continue being a cocky, arrogant, more athletic version of uh, Chris Masters. Let's be real for a second. This match was fucking fantastic. I'm still going to stick to my guns. This should have been the opening match. Tezawa versus Andrews should have been the closing match. Great to see Andrews. Um progress in the tournament did not expect it you know tyler Bate came in not really a 205 guy he was there to put over tjp but then you have roderick strong who wasn't really in the division but he's advanced you got mark andrews who really what the hell else is he going to do because the uk guys don't have a show yet he gets to advance i mean buddy murphy's going to advance next week and mustafa ali's going to advance next week um I i'm kind of bummed out by how predictable I think those matches are. I mean, obviously, they could surprise me. They could want, you know, Davari to progress for some reason. Gallagher, Gallagher, as great as he is, and as much as I like the whole proper British guy thing, the shtick, they went too far with the suits and the umbrellas and the, you know, him sucking up to Kendrick, which made no sense. So they really, if they want to progress him in the tournament and make me give a shit, they really have to hit, not necessarily a reset, but a rewind on, on Gallagher, because I loved him in the Cruiserweight Classic as well. Um, he's a bad guy, but he's a bad guy sidekick to Kendrick, who I believe is still injured. So he really doesn't have an identity right now, and there's no Zotrain, train, so Davari doesn't really have an identity right now. Buddy Murphy has revamped himself to join 205 Live, so he really doesn't have an identity right now. Mustafa Ali is over as fuck. I'm calling it right now. Uh, I will do something if Mustafa Ali gets beaten by Jack Gallagher next week, because that will be a misstep. It'll be the first misstep, really, that I've seen since the rebirth of 205 Live. Now, stick around. Come and see me tomorrow night. Tomorrow night's NXT. We've got a UK match. Sorry, we've got a UK championship match and a women's championship match. We've got Shayna Baszler versus Ember Moon. We've got Roderick Strong versus Pete Dunne. Pete Dunne, who I've seen twice live now, is fucking amazing. Him versus Roderick Strong is going to be a lot of fun. So come see me tomorrow night when we talk about NXT. But for right now, I've been Spaz, your YWC reality check subscribe up there talk down there start a conversation keep all these conversations going don't be a stranger i will talk to each and every last one of you later but for right now i am tagging out bye guys